and we're so grateful to have uh, Dr. Sedlacek with us this evening, um, talking about uh, economic transformation. Now, um, this is the first time that we've had an economist at a business meeting. Uh, you know, one of my favorite stories that, um, that I read in a book by um, E.F. Schumacher, who, who was a, a German um, who uh, emigrated to the United Kingdom uh, before, the, I think, before the Second World War. And he was a, an economist who wrote a book called Small is Beautiful, which was very, very influential in, uh, in economics in the 70s and 80s. And uh, he told a story about when he was riding in a train in, uh, in Wales, I think it was, in, in the story in the book, in a compartment together with a, uh, with a surgeon and an architect. And he, the economist, was discuss discussing with the surgeon and with the architect who has the oldest profession. And so um, the, the surgeon started first and he said, well, I am a, stud a student of the Bible. And I know that, uh, that Adam was taken out of the, or Eve was taken out of the rib of Adam, and so that is a surgical operation, and so I obviously have the oldest profession here. And so the architect uh, then started, and he said, well, listen, I know my Bible too. And uh, in my Bible it said that God created the heavens and the earth out of the chaos. And that's a typical job of an architect, so I have the oldest profession. And so E.F. Schumacher, the economist, said, well, who do you think created the chaos? <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, <we're laughs> I'll probably get kicked out for this. <laughs> I apologize to Dr. Sedlicek. Uh, welcome. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Sedlicek to come up and uh, speak to us uh, now. He is the chief uh, macroeconomic strategist at a major Czech bank. A uh, member of a special group under the auspices of Manuel Barroso, the president of the European Commission, on studying the narrative, the big story about uh, Europe. And uh, he's also a member of the World Economic Forum, thinking especially about uh, new ways of, uh, of thinking about economics. Dr. Sedlacek in the past was uh, advisor to um, the former president, Václav Havel, here, and later to the finance minister of the Czech Republic, has been a member of the National Economic Council here between 2009 and 2013. And uh, most of you, though, will know him from his book, uh, which was called The, uh, the Economics of, of Good and Evil. And uh, I've read that. It's a, a fascinating book, a, a, a book which is a kind of a pathfinder in thinking about uh, economics. And so I hope that, uh, that you'll be able to challenge our thinking tonight, uh, Dr. Sedlicek. And may I in uh, invite you to come and take the floor yes. and uh, address us this evening. A pleasure. So the floor is all yours. Thank you. After his speech, we will... Thank you. Thank you very much. After the speech, we will be discussing some of the aspects of what uh, Dr. Sedlicek has been uh, talking to us about this evening. Uh, so, right, jot down your, your questions, and uh, we will discuss these with a the panel afterwards. So, um, thank you very much. We are very honored that you're with us, thank and uh, we're looking forward to what you have to share with us this evening. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. So, thank you for a very kind introduction. <clears throat> it's a great pleasure to be here with you to read for you one chapter from my book. So page to, page to turn, turn to the page 231. No, but I have been asked specifically to talk about a specific subject, which is also very nice because usually I talk about non-specific subjects. So the, the title of today's, um, 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 I was asked to talk about progress, new Adam and uh, Shabbat economics. Now, uh, I will start talking in a conservative manner, and then I will uh, go into more, uh, let's say, provocative or more what I would consider more revolutionary way of looking at things, if you, of course, allow me. Hailstorms and, and, and firing rods are available at your disposal outside the doors, of course. No. Um, but uh, whistle when you think that I'm going too far. Okay. So, um, so um, first, uh, that we talk about this idea of progress, this is, this is an interesting thing because most 
actually even very serious philosophers and um, even scientists and even economists, which of course are neither of the two above mentioned group which I have just uh, named, um, uh, seem to be in, in unison, not all of them, but many of them, or representative, I mean important representatives of all of these fields, agree that science has in fact replaced religion. Uh, that uh, one way to look at it is that, again, some philosophers, or mainly sociologists, happen to arrive at the conclusion that today we live in the, what they call post-ideological time. Um, in fact, nothing would be perhaps further from the truth. Uh, we live in the most ideological times of all. Only we no longer uh, consider these ideologies to be ideologies. We consider these things to be scientifically true. Not realizing that science is just a replacement and a new form of ideology. Now, there's nothing wrong, of course, with ideology. Um, it's just, it depends how deep do you dig. Uh, when, you, when you take a look on the book of Job, there is what Slavoj Žižek, which is one of the most influential philosophers today, um, says that the book of Job is the oldest critique of, um, of ideology perhaps ever performed by, by mankind. Here, Job wants to know, basically, the meaning of pain. In these 41 chapters, Job doesn't really want his suffering to end. What he really wants is to know why. Give me the reason, give me the meaning. In other words, he's asking for the ideology. How, shan, how can I interpret this empirical event in my theoretical understanding? And the answer that um, God provides is a very, very, very curious answer because it is a non-answer. So Job and his friends, you know, they really have very, very important questions about the meaning of life, the meaning of pain. Is God just, is, is God above ethical norms or is he below them? In other words, whatever God does, does it automatically become ethical or is it the other way around? This is a very difficult question to answer. And they are going deep into philosophy, deep into theology, and deep into things that we um, like to go into. And then God answers, and this is a very curious speech indeed because it is the longest monologue of God in the whole Bible, which you probably know. It is also, to my knowledge, and if I please correct me, but in any uh, religion, di uh, deities usually speak very briefly. You must have noticed that. Um, uh, so here we have the longest monologue of God, which goes over almost four chapters. So one would expect something crucially important theologically to be discovered or learned. And here God goes on for half an hour talking about National Geographic. <laughs> or perhaps a discovery channel mode. You know, have you seen the birds and the bees and, and that thing called Leviathan that nobody even knows what it is? And to make the matters even more complicated, he ends the last chapter talking about behemoth. So in other words, Zizek want, uh, sorry, uh, Job wants uh, an ideology of pain, the reason of pain, why is this happening? And he has very good questions to answer, uh, to ask. And God says, you know, in fact, there is, I'm not going to give you an answer. Um, so this is, this is, of course, a very, very disturbing thought, something with which we Christians will find it extremely difficult to live, like the friends of Job. That's why they were saying the things that they did. And most of the things they said were very nice things about God. They were defending God. You know, God is, in fact, deed. You just don't understand. He's very mysterious. What's mysterious about being nasty to somebody who's righteous? That's just nasty. You know, it's nothing mysterious. This is also quite unfair. Whenever something nice happens, a child is born, we praise the Lord. For, you know, this is 
such a beautiful miracle. And then when something bad happens, he's mysterious. You know, that's hardly fair. And um, anyway, so jo Job has these good questions, and um, all, his, all what his friends are trying to do is to defend God, and then God says, they have not spoken well of me, which is what we do. People come with good questions, and we give them stupid plastic answers that we ourselves don't believe in. But nevertheless, uh, let's go back to the idea of progress. In the original cultures, the progress was, was a completely different way that we think of today. Most cultures, Hebrew uh, including, also Greeks and others, had the idea that in the beginning things were perfect and then time is a deterioration of reality into more and more decadent forms thereof. You still hear this opinion even among people today. You know, it used to be better when I was young and things are getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. Um, but quite frankly, what people tried to do is through the rituals in the Bible, for example, to recuperate time and reenact re re the original settings uh, in the creation. A good example is, for example, week. And Shabbat of that is we rest like the Lord rested. So in this we are participating not only symbolically, but we are healing time as if going back enacting this or staging this situation where things were still perfect. Okay, so now today we have, um, we have sort of um, a secularized idea of progress of heaven in the form of heaven on earth. This is exactly what science is to bring us, specifically, for example, the body of economics, our hope is somewhere in the future. C.S. Lewis puts it quite nicely. He says, goodness equals what comes next. So in other words, goodness is not here. It is in the future. The kingdom of, I don't know what, kingdom on earth of righteousness will be in the future. It is the hope of, of progress on which we must be building with the idea that we end up in the same sort of paradise setting like when things were created. Now, you can see this quite nicely even in the Bible. The first, the first happy moments are in the Garden of Eden, and then the paradise in the book of, um, in the book of uh, John um, is also some sort of a paradise. The difference is in the first, the first haven is in the garden, it's in nature, whereas in the book of John, the paradise is situated in a city. There is a river there, there is a tree there, but otherwise it's a city. This brings about another crucial idea with which the Hebrews battled their, their surrounding nations, because the idea, which was quite, uh, quite strong, for example, with the Babylonians, was that civilization is symbolized by cities. In other words, nature or a natural state of being was evil. You can see this quite nicely in the Epic of Gilgamesh, that you know, um, uh, Gilgamesh, the mighty tyrant of Ur, builds this strong fortified city to fend it off the evils and the whims of nature. While the Hebrews were always very skeptical of cities, as you know from your Old Testament times, before Jerusalem was established. Hebrews were, you know, you got Sodom and Gomorrah, you've got the Tower of Babel. Uh, cities were usually looked down upon because Hebrews lived in a, in, a nomadic, in a nomadic way. So that's also important because the question is, is human being a human being in his natural form or does human being become a human being through culturing of the children into the civilization which is symbolized by a city. Now, if you happen to be born in a city, this is, uh, this is a thought which is not mine, but I envy my dear, so 
giant on whose shoulder I'm trying to stand a little bit. Um, Ivan Ilyich was, was an Austrian theologian, not much known today, uh, even among Christian circles. But he said, if you were born in a city, you have never seen anything natural. Not once. Look around you just now. All you see is artificial products made usually of artificial things that we've stolen deep in the ground where we're never supposed to even be. We took them, we beat them, we heat them, we turned them, we twisted them under the exercise of extreme violence to put them into a form that makes sense, but only in a context of human society. If you find a chair like this in the forest, there's no use, and anything that you see around you is useless, utilityless, in a situation of nature. So you will say, no, but look, there are trees right there. I see a tree. Tree is a natural thing. Well, no, tree is there because some bureaucrat decided that it would look good there. <laughs> and you will say, no, but I can go to, I don't know, Tibet or some other place where nature is unscratched by or not destroyed. You can see this again, you know, the idea that nature is destroyed by civilization, and I can see the real there. And again, I would say, no, you can't really do that because you have your credit card in your back pocket. And it is, it's a tourism, it's a zoo for you. Never mind that you're really in the real setting, it's a zoo. It's, you're not really part of that, part of that nature. Okay, so, um, so um, that's that. Um, now, um, what needs to be, I think, understood is how economics uh, has, uh, so that's, that was not provocative at all, I think. Okay, we go to provocativeness uh, level two. Um, what, must, what must be understood, I think, is that economics has in this way taken, I would claim, the role of, uh, uh, of religion telling us what to do, where to go, what to think, what to believe, what values to have, what prices to expect. Um, uh, and it is something that now leads us into the future, giving us hopes, giving us disappointments, and giving us reasons to uh, do 90% of our daily tasks. Um, I will first try to build my argument using uh, a, a little bit ridiculous example of even how Christian argumentation is in fact hedonism in disguise. We tell people, you know, don't do bad things because in long run it will decrease your utility. Which, you know, is an argumentation that nobody, well, you of course, one can use it, but we must know that we are using here hedonist uh, or utilitarian, which is economic argumentation. Um, secondly, let's give a practical example. Here in my country, we have now grown the habit of calculating economic consequences of corruption. I don't know whether you do this in your, in your hobbies as well, but economists are now asked to the table how harmful is corruption to the uh, growth of GDP, hoping that the answer will be negative so that we have more arguments to curb corruption, which is, if you think of it, something that's utterly perverse. Why? Well, what if we discover that corruption is beneficial for GDP growth? <laughs> you know, that could be the case. There's many economists who would argue that. Bernard Mandeville, even in his, in his famous or infamous book, uh, uh, The Feeble of the Bees, or How Private Vices Bring Public Benefits, in the title, you can hear it. Private Vices, Corruption, Gluttony, uh, whatever, um, brings public benefits. And, and, there, and there is a school of thought that, that pretty much follows it. I would even argue that it has become a mainstream economic thinking. This is the idea of the invisible hand of the market. You input egoism, you input self-interest, um, and uh, the outcome is uh, common good. So it's the exact reversal of what you read in, uh, uh, in the epistle to Romans when Paul says, I want to do good, but uh, for some reason I end up doing bad. The invisible hand of the market is the exact opposite. I want to do evil, but God damn it, I, uh, I did good again. You know, 
you are sort of cursed in this perpetual creation of good, no matter how, how, how hard you try. No. But, um, yeah, so, so, so corruption or the idea of stealing becomes a subset of an economic argument. The same you can hear, and this is quite prevalent across all Europe, um, is this idea of, of calculating the um, economic impact of art. Again, you must have read about this, that you know, there's always some people who come up with, I don't know, that supporting art brings up half a point of GDP or something. Some laugh, you know, well, okay. Um, and again, my question is, well, what if we come to the conclusion that art, in fact, stops GDP growth, which I would you know, intuitively say that's what art is for. You know. <laughs> Without art, we would be looking forward to go work as hard as we can to increase the GDP of whoever commands us, whatever, in the gray suit, you know, being in cubicles of the same size, which is something that you beautifully see in all these sort of dystopias like um, Brave New World or George Orwell's 1980 for or um, Equilibrium, if, 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 you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you recall that. that way. That's how we would look without art. We would be completely buying into this economic ideology, working as hard as we are asked to. You know, this is what this is what um, this is what Oscar Wilde once very famously stated in the end of the, conclu uh, end the at the end of the introduction to the picture of Dorian Gray. He concludes with saying that all art is quite useless. Not saying that it should be thrown away, but that art is exempt from the imperative of having to be useful. So we are now putting it again, oh no, but art is quite useful because, you know, not only does it look good, but it even increases. So again, what if we find out that art is slowing our GDP growth because people spend futile time in galleries, uh, you know, or they watch a painting on the wall while they could be working? Would that then mean that we should stop supporting art? And the ultimate argument of many Christian parties uh, is that for some reason Christian parties, I don't know if you've noticed, there's some, somewhat of a paradox. Christian parties have taken the topic of a family as their own. Which to me is quite curious because if you, you know, go into the New Testament, there's not much positive about the idea of uh, family life. You are my mother? Who, you know, who's my mother? Who's my father? I don't know you. I want to be your disciple, but my father just passed away and I would need to bury him. Uh, He's dead. Forget about him. That's, you know, we would not call that nice behavior today. Or what about, you know, who doesn't hate his mother and his father and his brother and his sister and whoever else is around him is not worth of my following. If this is not enough, well, then read what Paul thinks about marriage. You know, it's much better not to be married, but if you can't hold your horses, well, then, you know, <laughs> do it. But, oh, my God, you know, you really can save yourself a lot of trouble by saving yourself a lot of trouble. So it's not exactly, you know, uh, a big, big topic of, of, um, of, uh, of uh, or, or how about this one? A, a priest should be a husband of one wife. Oh, so if you're not a priest, then... Of course, you can interpret this many ways, but... This, to me, seems to be sort of the first, uh, first idea. But anyway, okay. Um, now, I'm saying all this because at the end of the day, the Christian argumentation for happy family and why we support families is because it's economically unsustainable not to. And the second sentence will immediately be, you know, but so you see how pension system is approached. It's, it's a result of deterioration of the family and da di da di da di da di da di da So again, you see that a family value has been put as a supportive value of economic progress. That art has been curbed to a supporting value of economic growth and not stealing is um, also uh, put as a supportive argument for uh, fostering GDP growth. 
Now, what comes, what comes uh, also in this section of midi mildly disturbing is uh, the fact that that's why the whole commandment of Shabbat disappeared from the Christian discourse um, completely because we have also bought into it, I would argue. Well, what do, I, what do you mean? Well, first of all, it's the first real commandment. It's the fourth commandment, way before adultery, way before murdering and everything else. The fourth commandment is you will keep your, your Shabbat. And it wasn't a suggestion. It was a commandment for which people got stoned. I mean, stoned with stones. <laughs> this, wor this joke works in the Netherlands. <laughs> And in Czech Republic. I can see that not all of you have made the connection. So if you break your Shabbat, you must get stoned. Um, uh, we made it into a Christian suggestion. So, okay, well then, dear friends, let me treat with the same frivolity the other commandments as well. Thou shalt not commit adultery unless she's attractive. You will not work on Saturday unless you have something really important to do. Okay, well, don't kill anybody unless he's a real idiot. Then it's okay. But do it in some sort of a human way. Don't torture him or her. Do it quickly. I mean, what gave us the liberty to talk about such details like homosexuality, which is in priority number 3,847 in the Bible, while we completely forgot about this whole idea of, of, of Shabbat? And how else, how else would our message look to the world if we actually said, you know what, slow down and relax. You're not here to work. You've got enough. And uh, we had this talk today with, with, with Bruno that the difference between Greek ideas of perceiving the world and the Hebrew ideas of perceiving the world. Greeks perceive and describe the world by vision. We still have that in the English. When you understand something, you say, I see. You have a light bulb when you understand something. Yeah, but the, the Hebrews used more the, uh, the uh, audio. Hear, O Israel, the stories are nice to talk, but they're impossible to make a movie out of. That's why all the Christian movies about the Bible turned to be a disaster, because it was never meant to be so. While the Greek myths are exactly made for Hollywood, because they're just, you know, everybody's beautiful, and they have these things that everybody wants to have. They're called six-packs. And um, you, you, you are a morally better person if you have those. Uh, and that's my, other, that's my other point, how uh, you, but this is just a, 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 this is just a footnote. I like footnotes. Have you ever noticed how ethics has shifted into what we eat and how we look? The cult of the body has completely predominated. How many of you smoke, actually? See, nobody. Because we all bought into this cult of, of, of body because we need to be here as long as possible because we're the best people in the world. So that's mediocre, me, uh, mildly provocative. Still on the, on the mildly? But I was in the United States of America and there was this big, big uh, advertisement and what it advertised was guilt-free chips. So I immediately thought to myself, well, isn't this funny? that I am guilty, and I feel guilty, and I really effectively do feel guilty if I eat chips that are, I don't know what's wrong with them, greasy ones or, or, them, or some, something that I don't even know the name of, but it's definitely very harmful. And if I put that into my mouth, I become a guilty person. So just, I mean, I don't want to go into this, but if it's useful for your thoughts, just study how exactly Jesus says it is not what enters your mouth that makes you dirty, but that what leaves you makes you dirty. But no, so that's why I think we don't like smoking is because you inhale it and it goes out. It looks bad. It look, you look like a little devil there. <laughs> that's why I also think we don't like coffee versus tea because coffee has this dark color. And it's scary to some. So we have coffee without cof 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 caffeine. Nevertheless, uh, uh, I don't want to talk about the cult of the body. I wanted to talk about Shabbat. And how I got there, I don't know. Yeah, guilt. Yeah, no, how, 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 how this ethics really, really changes from, from, um, from, for example, keeping the Shabbat 
to now, you know, living a healthy, healthy life. Now, uh, we still, of course, have a weekend, but the whole idea of rest, again, like family art and corruption and other things, of course, as well, resting, I would argue, today has become, again, a subset of working better and harder. Why? Well, because we rest in order to be more effective the next day. Which is not the case of God when he was creating. He didn't have a next universe to you know, start working on Monday morning. <laughs> he rested because he was done. Well, we are never done. Why? Because we have this never-ending imperative to, to, to improve ourselves. And this is not only in economics, this is also if you study psychology, this is also big mantra in psychology, and this is also big mantra in Christian education, no matter where you are, as long as you get better. So, um, and I will come back to the idea of better in the third most provocative part, I hope, of my, um, of my talk today. But anyway, back to Shabbat. So, um, we no longer understand that resting is there when you're done. I've, I've, I've done it, you know, this was funny, I, was, I have a friend, and when I met him, uh, you know, my name is this, and his name was something else, which was funny, and um, so, like people do, I also asked him, so what do you do? And he said, nothing, I'm done. <laughs> and I thought, what a wonderful, what a wonderful answer. We, you know, we're never done, because there's always something terribly important to, 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 um, to, to, to torment us. Um, um, sorry? Yeah, if, if, you, if, if there's anything. Uh, uh, by the way, I would be very happy if you have any comments or questions or, or um, anything else, really, uh, just raise your hand and, and I'll be happy to, uh, I'll be happy to, um, to answer that. So, so um, this, this whole idea of, of not being able to rest, and if we are able to rest, it is only to be rest, more, more restless the next morning or just recuperate or rejuvenate our strength from the loss of energy due to work is something that is, again, an idea of, um, of, of this secularized progress on which we must very Calvinistically work, because it is work that, um, um, that sort of shows how well we are uh, doing in our spiritual world. Okay, now, uh, in the last part, um, I want to talk about a, a thought that I'm not sure will, will resonate in most of you, and if that's the case, then just forget it, I am wrong. In tradition, what I, what I do, what I spend last year studying is the sort of mental mythologies that we have in our heads. Um, um, for example, just to give an example, the, 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 the Marxist critique of the system is that it oppresses us. The system oppresses us, uh, alienates us from ourselves, from our closed ones, and this allows us to be our true self. It alienates us from the work, sorry, from the product of our labor, etc., etc. Now, I don't want to go into Marxism. This is, of course, not the topic of the talk today. I just want to focus on the, men what the mental image that it creates in you. In most of our heads, it creates an image that this suppression is happening from above. Yeah, you want to stand tall and breathe, but the system is pushing you down, not making you possible, not, not being able to be your higher self. Um, okay. Now, my question is, where did this image of oppression from above come from? Because that's something that we don't know where we bought. What if this oppression is sideways? That's an oppression, okay? I want to go straight, but the system is pushing me where I don't really want to go. Absolutely possible, but you can immediately see how the whole discourse changes just because a random position of this oppressing force is changed. Now let me make one more step. What if this oppression happens from below? 
In other words, the system alienates me from the lower me. And in fact, if you think about it, the system will much more often alienate you from the lower you rather than from the higher you. So if you want to spend all your life in charity, the system will applaud you. If you really want, you know, go and live on a, on a kibbutz, the system will applaud you. If you really want to just, you know, whatever. System will rarely, of course, occasionally also, but rarely the system will prevent you. But it does alienate me from the lower me because sometimes I really feel like killing somebody. But I know that the system disallows me to do that because it would sanction me with imprisonment. So yes, I feel alienated from myself, which is a good thing in this case, if the oppression comes from below. Now, this is, of course, a debate that I don't want to enter. My whole point in this five minutes exercise was that the mental mythology that we have unchecked, uncontrolled, unexamined in our heads is, at the end of the day, determining. So if we, for example, had the idea of oppression from below, if I said, the system, the, if I said to you, the system is oppressing us, you would go, hallelujah. Whereas if we had the image oppression from above, and I would say the same sentence, the system is oppressing us, you would say, yeah, we need to change the system. And my last, my last comment, which has to do with Christianity, about this criticism that Marx had against capitalism, it is an absolutely misdirected criticism because what Marx criticizes is that the system is screwed up, which is something that you read on every single page of the New Testament. The system is not okay, the system is weird, the system is in the power of, 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 of the dark, dark one, and you shouldn't be surprised that the system is full of paradoxes. And if Marx criticizes uh, uh, industrialization, then he criticizes industrialization, but not capitalism. If he criticizes the fact that you have to go work and do, uh, do, do labor that, it, that you know, makes you less of a human being or it makes you into a robot, he's right. It's got nothing to do with capitalism because that was the same thing was happening during communism. Etc., etc., etc. So what Marx was really criticizing was urbanization, industrialization, um, and most importantly, human condition. Because, and that's something that you can read perfectly well and better in the pages of New Testament. In this, Marx was, uh, was um, uh, a Christian critique, follower of Christian criticism of the system of the world to the purest, interestingly enough. Okay, but never mind. Now, let me just use that mental imagery, um, if, if I may, about the idea of good and evil. We have the idea that good and evil are like this, yeah? In our heads, when I say good and evil, we immediately have this image. That there is some dotted line. I have a dotted, what do you have? I have a dotted line around zero. Uh, and good and evil are mirror sort of distance from that neutral ground. Which, of course, immediately, if you pause, this, this, come, this creates 10,000 problems because this is, of course, Dualism, this is something that has been even proclaimed as early as 300s as a Manichaean heresy, that, God, that good and evil are, in fact, equal in absolute value. <laughs> you know, if, if, for those of you who are ma slightly mathematical, absolute value is the value of a number without the minus sign. So if you, good and evil are equal in the absolute value if we couldn't see the minus sign, which is complete, of course, nonsense. The second problem is the existence of the dotted line. What does that mean? Is there a neutral, some sort of a zero line through which things get mirrored? But what if good, evil, in fact, are positioned like this? Let me, let me spend a couple of minutes explaining this. Philosophers and ethicists have had a problem of millennia to explain what I call the problem of gravity of evil. If good and evil are like this, then why would people do evil things? What's the reason? And of course, there are many answers to that, but none of them are very good. What's the gravity of evil? Why would people do evil things if evil is evil and good is good? Why don't they do good things? 
if you reposition in your heads good, evil, not saying that evil is better than good, but it's here in that mental image, then we immediately understand why people and us are attracted to evil. And now let me give examples so that my, my thought is not as provocative as perhaps it sounds. In the Garden of Eden, Eden, <laughs> in the Garden of Eden, everything was even. <laughs> in the Garden of Eden, everything was good, 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 until Adam and Eve came up with the idea to make it better. Your partner is very good until you meet somebody with nicer teeth. Then that good is tormented exactly because of, because of that which is better. Why am I using this? Well, because that's exactly what torments our society. We are doing good. What torments us is the idea that we could be doing better. That's what we cannot rest. That's why we've ignored the fourth commandment for very economic reasons. And that's why a lot of things in this world don't really make sense. And that's why, and this is something that I found extremely helpful when last time I met, I, we, we debated this in, uh, in Brussels, uh, in the book of Job, the uh, devil in Hebrew is introduced as a perfecter. So again, the bet is clear. God, let's replay the book of Job. Of course, this is going to be a paraphrase, but you know, God somehow summoning his, his sons and the devil comes along. God starts the dialogue, by the way and says, hey, what's up? Or perhaps, you know, what's down? <laughs> and, uh, and the devil says, well, you know, not much, nothing. It's actually a very rude way of answering nothing. And God continues the debate saying, oh, have you noticed, uh, you know, how clever is this, you know, drawing the attention of a devil to somebody who you like. But never mind. Uh, have you noticed Job? He is righteous, and I'm very happy with him. And the devil says, well, is that really so? Couldn't we make that better. Couldn't we test that hypothesis? And you must have noticed, because the book of Job, in my opinion, is one of the most beautiful books in, in the Old Testament, you must have noticed how weirdly the book ends. In the beginning, there is some sort of a weird bet between devil and God of sorts. God allows devil to do a very nasty thing. If you had a friend like that, you know, it wouldn't be very friendly. But, you know, he's God, so we kind of forgive him. Um, at the end of the book, you would expect God summoning the devil and saying, so, you know, you're lost. You owe me, I don't know, 12 bottles of champagne or you will burn in hell forever. I don't know what the bet was. But you would expect some sort of a closure of that original plot. But it disappears. Why? Exactly because that wasn't the point of the story. The point of the story was that something that was good in itself was disturbed by this test of making it better. And that's the problem with economic growth. That's exactly uh, the idea of progress. What I'm saying is a double-edged sword. Progress is Janus-faced. It has, uh, of course, the propensity to make things better, which, of course, better is better. No doubt about that. But at the end, uh, uh, at, uh, on the same, at the same time, it is the tormentor that um, creates uh, these temptations and um, these, uh, these, these tensions. Now, let me conclude and then go into questions, questions and answers with my last provocative uh, thought, which is the idea of Skidelsky, father and son book, how much is enough? In other words, many people come to me and ask me, so will we ever be happy? Will we ever be content? Um, and uh, that's an interesting question because, of course, we Christians have this story of, the, of Eden in which things were created good by God. So we must ask ourselves, was Adam happy in paradise? And was Eve happy in paradise? And was God happy in paradise before the whole thing with the uh, fruit came? 
Now, if you read the first book of uh, Moses very carefully, uh, it is disturbing reading. Why? And this is also something that few theologians have, have, have noticed or commented upon. God creates this and that, and it's good, and it's good, and then he creates Adam, and it's good, but then he says not good. Do you know where? Exactly. God. So it must be true. God says it is not good. Something there is not good. Before we did anything. Okay, so not our fault. Yeah? God said it is not good for man to be alone. So in other words, Adam was alone. So the first emotion, if I take this literally, which I was trained in my fundamentalist uh, sola scriptura training, uh, if I'm to take this literally and offer a new interpretation, or uh, another layer of interpretation, of course, it's, it's, it's somewhat disturbing to see that even in the perfect harmony of freshly created paradise, universe, the real was still, Adam was still in, 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 in warranty, you know, freshly made, no psychological, no psychological disturbances, no Oedipus complexes, not, no, no, no air pollution, everything was bio. <laughs> um, there was something that wasn't good in, uh, in the garden, and that was the feeling of, of loneliness, that Adam felt in fact, alone. Um, and then he creates another human being. This is again, I think, something that many theologians overlook and they focus on the, on the, on the, on, on the sexist dynamics between man and woman and I'm sick and tired of it. What I think is important to look at is that another human being was created. The differences that men and women have are minor to the similarities that we have. It's true, biologically speaking. <laughs> Stupid joke. <laughs> um, uh, everybody overlooked the fact that it wasn't just a woman, but it was another human being and a sort of a love triangle um, um, evolved there. But anyway, when Eve goes, or the other human being, doesn't really, in my opinion, matter it was a man or, or, or woman or, or, or whatever, the other human being, when, when, when it eats from the fruit of good and, uh, knowledge of good and evil, she is also alone. So... Were things perfect in the garden? We, did we feel well? Did we feel content? Did we feel spiritually filled? It's not, I mean, we don't hear anywhere in the book of Genesis that the first 200 years in the garden were very harmonious and there was lots of parties. First argument. Second argument is that even in the perfect uh, situation where people didn't have to work or labor, um, people were discontent, and they, so I think this is what Adam and Eve must have been thinking. You know, it's all good, but is this all there is to the real? Well, let's try and improve the real a little bit. Let's, let's introduce some dynamics. Let's know a little bit more. Again, a lot of theologians focus on the idea that this was a tree of good and evil, which is fine. I would like to bring back to the focus, to the first name, of the tree, which was a tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's also something that we forgot, that they actually gained knowledge. And by gaining that knowledge, they have now become like us, God says, knowing the difference between, between good and evil. In other words, God already knew the difference between good and evil, but he wanted us human beings to be saved from that experience. In other words, to be, I mean, one has a feeling that he wanted us to be a little bit more ignorant than we would uh, accept. So we were not happy in that blissful ignorance. I don't mean ignorance in a negative, or not, not unknowledge, let's just use that word, less provocative. Um, in that unknowledge of good and evil, we learned something, we 
It's also, I think this must be the same word used in Hebrew when a man knows a woman. So in that sort of a sexual way, we have also become intimate with good and evil. We have had intercourse with, with, with good and evil by, by eating that fruit. And uh, human beings have upgraded downwards. So um, um, let, me, let me conclude with, with, with an economic interpretation of the Garden of Eden. This is what an economist, this is, this is what happens when an economist reads the, the, the story of, of, of Eden. Okay, so what's my point? My point is, no, we will never be content. And this is interesting because God, uh, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is where? Among you. I don't think he ever said the kingdom of God is in you, by the way. So if you've been looking inside, doing all sorts of you know, meditations and trying to you know, um, remedy your psychological construction so that you live, okay, it's really heaven on earth. I'm seeing hell, but it's heaven. It's just a state of mind. It's just a state of mind. It's just a state of mind. It's just the problem that I don't have my psychological whatever clockwork set right. No, you will never find kingdom of heaven inside of you because it's never been there. The kingdom of God is among you, not in you, among you. Another thought, if it's useful, use it. If it's not useful, don't use it. In, in the same way, I didn't finish the thought the, comparing the Greek and um, Hebrew ways of perceiving the world. Greeks used visual descriptions while Hebrews used audio descriptions. It's also funny when I talk with my atheist friends and, you know, the more simple ones say, you know, but, you know, nobody's ever seen God and, or an angel. So, you know, of course, it's a stupid thing to, to believe. And I say, yeah, this is, of course, true. Nobody's ever seen God, but are you sure you didn't hear him? Even the most hardcore atheists uh, pause and sing and say, oh, actually, well, hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I said, no, don't tell me, but just tell me that you're sure... You have never heard him, like you're sure you've never seen him, which is, yeah, that's the way he is. He's not, he's not your, um, your you know, Greek hero, but are you sure you never heard him? No, nobody's sure that he's never, or she's never, never heard him. Okay, so that was my point, which I, which I skipped, which I thought was a good point. Um, <laughs> um, it's a friendly point to evangelists. Uh, and then, of course, now I need to be nasty again. Anytime anybody's thinking of becoming a Christian, I tell him, well, you know, read the book of Job first so that you know with whom you're dealing. <laughs> Later complaints will be disregarded. You have two weeks. Read the book of Job at least three times and then tell me that you still want to have anything to do with this dude. Yeah? Because that's how Job would say it. The friends of Job would hide the book of Job because it was uncomfortable for them, because God didn't come out as a great hero in that book. According to Job, anyway. Uh, now I've, I have heard about you, but now I have seen you. What's missing there is the emotion. Did Job say it? I have heard about you, but now I see you. Or did Job say, I've heard about you, and now I see you. You don't answer my questions. It's impossible to talk with you. I've asked you very kindly many times not to answer me from a position of power, which is exactly what you did. I have never doubted that you're the big dude. I never claim that I understand anything about the reality. Don't, you know. I have only tried to understand why are you shooting your arrows into me? What is, how can I learn from this? Well, have you heard about the birds and the bees and the behemoth and the leviathan? Nobody knows what. Now, interestingly enough, by the way, my last disturbing question, and then I'll be nice again. Uh, did you actually notice that the questions that God asks us are questions that a scientist would be more ready to answer than a theologian? Do you know how the stars were born? No, but Einstein has an idea. Yeah, that Albert guy with the fluffy hair. Ask him. Do you know where the gazelles feed in the night? I don't know, but here's National Geographic issue on gazelles. 
Do you know the depths of the sea? No, but we have sonars now. That's, I think, also something that is interesting. God is not interested in, okay, and not, again, a provocative way how to read the book of Job is God is not interested in these things. He doesn't want to talk theology over and over again. He wants to run and enjoy the creation together with us. Your questions are meaningless. There is no idea to this. Forget it. You think, you think you're, you're, you're screwed up? I mean, look at the world. I am in control of everything, and I am, my head is full of it. Now, I promised a nice conclusion. Yes. So, this is how an economist reads the, 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 the book of Genesis, and then let's go into the debate, if, 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 if you'd like that. Uh, in the medieval times, uh, the original sin was often interpreted as a sin of sexual nature. We live in an over-sexualized society. That's why we Christians are so sensitive about homosexuality and not about Shabbat. One, one way how to, how to read that. So also we have a tendency or had a tendency to read the original sin as a sin of sexual nature. Two young people naked in the garden. You sort of get it. But if you read the book very carefully, the word sex really doesn't appear there not once. The word that does appear 14 times over the span of two pages is the word consume. Don't consume, they consume, it was good to consume, the snake came to consume, she consumed, they gave Adam to consume, God said, did you consume, didn't consume, 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 consume. To me, that's bad literature. 14 times the same word over two pages, bad literature, unless you have a point. So, of course. I'm a stupid economist, so maybe the original sin was not a sin of sexual whatever fallacy, but in fact, you could read it as a sin of consumption, specifically the sin of overconsumption, because they were not satisfied with what God gave them. They wanted better, they ended up evil. So uh, even the curse that uh, Adam and Eve receives is, is, is an economic curse. I don't know if, you've ever, 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 if it ever jumped on you like it jumped on me two years ago. It was really funny. I had to laugh because economy is all about demand and supply. So Eve gets the curse of demand. You will demand, you will desire, but your desires will not be in you. They will be disjointed. They will be above you. You will not be in control of your desires. Your desires will be in control of you, and they will drive you crazy. You will be in their hands. Uh, and Adam, poor guy, gets the curse of supply. <laughs> you will work in the sweat of your bra. You will try to create supply, but even with the technology of the 21st century, all your work will not be enough to create enough supply so that your desires are satisfied. And that, my dear friends, is where I will close. That is the principal engine of the economy. If it is discontent that we have made the engine of our economy, then that's fine. It will bring us forward and forward and forward. It will con contribute to our GDP growth and whatnot. But if it's discontent that drives us, then we can't complain that we are not content. It's either one or the other. Either you're discontent and you try really, really, really hard to be content, or you're content and you don't have to try. But you can't have both. So will we ever be content? <coughs> Not until we realize that we're not here to, um, to uh, drive ourselves over the good what Lord gave us, if you take my meaning. Thank you very much for your kind attention, and I'm really looking forward for your uh, thoughts. Thank you. How do I... I think this is uh, working. I don't know how to turn this. this one is. Oh, oh, sorry. You need also for yes. Uh, can I turn this on? Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sedlacek. We we did promise to get you out of here on time. 
Oh, right. Uh, because you have something very special today. <laughs> right, yes. But it's okay. Uh, but no, so I'm sorry. This is my fault. But if, if, and if there are seriously questions, I will, I will, uh, I will be happy to entertain them. If, okay, if we that's do okay have, with uh, you. We do have a few minutes. So um, who would like to ask a question to Dr. Sedlicek? There is one there. They're in the same vector. You can take two microphones. So how does one learn the, the secret of being content in any and every situation, and what are the implications for the economy? Yeah, um, the economy does not want a content uh, society. In fact, if you, and this was something that I was doing with uh, Igor Krastev, I don't know if there's ever is anybody from Bulgaria. No, he's a wonderful intellectual from Bulgaria, and we, we're talking about this, and he said, you know, there were these sociological researches in, in, in countries such as um, Africa, and, and, and so a continent such as Africa, and countries such as India, and people were actually living very content life, satisfied with what they had, and uh, the primer explainer, or the, uh, the most significant um, 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 thing that explains discontent in these countries was not GDP growth or non-growth or social, it was the introduction of TV, interestingly enough. So these guys were quite happy living the way they were until they saw our advertisements, which are actually made exactly to libidize you. Um, let me, before I answer, um, I don't know, there's a very disturbing French movie, I could have just said there's a very, you know, French movie. <laughs> One should be also economic with words. But I love, I love disturbing uh, movies. It's called Le Grand Bouffe. I don't know if anyone... Have... Yes, yes, yes. I, um, so, you've, so you've seen it. Basically, basically there people are uh, eating, eating, eating uh, until they explode. What's interesting there is that um, we, during the communist regime, we also had um, economic crises, but these crises were of slightly different nature. We wanted sugar, but there was no sugar. We wanted razor blades, but there were no razor blades. We wanted cars, but we had to wait for two, three years before we got one. In other words, the demand again was okay, but the supply was malfunctioning. Today, the situation in our civilization is exactly the reverse. We have, the supply is okay, but the demand isn't. In other words, there is enough to eat, but nobody wants it. So there is enough of sugar, but nobody wants it. There is 14 different types of razor blades, but we don't want that many razor blades. And the problem is that we produce too many cars for, in other words, to cut the long story short, the economy does not eat everything it cooks. So I'm answering your question sort of uh, from, from a negative, from, from the opposite direction. What is our reaction? In other words, we have more than we want. Okay, in sort of, if you look at it from this perspective of this, of this movie. What is our solution? We cook more. Well, a natural solution is, okay, well, you know, nobody wants that many cars to be produced, is to stop producing these cars and have four days of rest instead of two days of rest, because we can absolutely afford it. The idea, what was the original promise when we were buying all these gadgets, do you remember? Computers and, and cell phones and all that? It will give you more time. <laughs> that was, and this is what, 10 years ago, I had my first email around, I don't know, 15 years ago. The idea was that it will give me more time. Well, it didn't give us more time, it gave us more wealth. So we've traded, uh, in, well, okay, so these machines sort of promised we will work in your stead, leaving you more time to do, to do leisure. And in fact, just imagine how much of your work could you do without your computers. Uh, it would take you a week without internet, without cell phones, without computers. It would take you at least a week to do your maybe two hours work worth of today. But we did not choose that as a civilization. We choose to work alongside with these, with these, with these gadgets. So um, um, even when the economy sort of comes to a forced Shabbat, we cannot, even when, when we are already full, we cannot expect that. And the whole thing that the government is doing today is creating artificial hunger in overfed 
Western society. So in other words, this is the meaning of fiscal policy. Fiscal policy, that means the deficit uh, or the extra spending of the government at the expense of the future, at the expense of debt. Um, the, 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 the whole fiscal policy is a trick pretending that there is demand where there is in fact no demand, creating thus a situation of artificially high, uh, uh, artificially low unemployment and um, uh, um, uh, uh, an image of an artificially high GDP growth. Mm. Of course, um, yeah, so, um, but to give you a practical answer, also one way how to read the Shabbat commandment. So, in other words, what you are asking is an undesired state of mind. We want our inhabitants to be aroused consumer-wise and also sexually, of course, all the time. And that's what advertisement is here for. That's why, the, that's why, that's why George Bush, when there was the, the, the Twin Tower attack, he could have reacted in 10,000 ways. He could have, you know, of course, 10,000 ways. What, he, what was interesting, you can, of course, see that on, on or re-see that on YouTube. What he said was, no, well, blah, blah, blah. You consume. What you can do as a holy act to recuperate from this attack is to consume. Which, to us, of course, doesn't seem strange, but it is really strange. Uh, but what did I want to say? Yeah, okay, so one way to strike a balance into this is um, one way to read the Shabbat commandment is, yeah, you can be discontent six days a week trying to change the reality into your image. This is what we are doing. Working is changing reality to the way we want or see fit to create a situation that's more comfortable for us. But... One day, out of the seven, be really happy that you live where you live. So complain about your stupid presidents and politicians and corruptions and the buses that are always late. But one day, out of seven, be happy that there are buses. And be happy that there are politicians and not something else. And be happy that, etc., etc., etc. That's sort of... Um, a balance that I take out of it. I would even go more than one seventh because I think we've overdid our, our, our situation. And I think that our problem is that we work too much. Which would, of course, get me going on, on, on the whole topic that the economy is not depressed, as you always read from the, from the media, because it was supposed to work like this, and so we're now... No, 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 the economy is not depressed. The economy is manic depressed, if anything. And all we want is our mania to come back. And that's how the, and I will end with this, that, and then I'll go to the next question. That's, uh, if you have time, two more minutes. Uh, that's how the American crisis, correct me if I'm wrong, that's how it started. It wasn't like the American economy got depressed and then the collapse came. GDP was record high for a record amount of years. Unemployment was extremely low, efficiency high. Innovation was, I mean, that was the, there was the period when, when Silicon Valley was bursting with ideas. In other words, the, 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 the macroeconomics of the United States in 2007 looked like the day-to-day, -day blue sky without a cloud, and that's when the whole system broke down. It was a full-throttle bankruptcy. It was a manic-induced suicide. Manias are as dangerous as depressions. Perhaps even more, because it's, because it's very difficult to convince a patient to go to, a, to see a doctor when he or she is manic. Uh, one of my um, uh, close friends just went through a manic phase and he was released from the hospital and I didn't know how to ask uh, how he is because, you know, how do you ask a person who's um, uh, healing from mania, so how are you? I'm really good. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> Compliments to your reasoning, but I have the following three questions. Oh, my, my God. God. Yep. <laughs> no, no, that's very simple. Luckily, very simple. I am equipped. Very simple, very simple. Do you think that there is evil, point one? 
Sorry, do I think that there is evil? Yeah, yes, absolutely. No, no, oh, yeah, okay. Then don't uh, answer too, too quick, please. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to be nice. <laughs> and uh, second is, uh, you know, in the Old Testament it's described that uh, the people very often followed the Lord and then he protected them and then they did uh, evil against him, against the people and so on and yep. so forth. And, and that was my second question in connection. And the third is then how to orientate in such a situation. Or explain, yeah, okay, I, yeah. Okay, so is there evil? Yes. I absolutely think that there is, is evil. Um, but it often takes the pretense of, some, of, of an improvement. Um, let, me, let, me, let me, okay, maybe I can, the things that I'm sharing with you are uh, thoughts in, in, uh, uh, in progress. Since, aha, now I did it myself. You see? So take whatever is useful, whatever is not useful, throw away. This is how I read books. Um, I, I'm not sure I agree with myself on, on most, most times. So. But, <laughs> which is, I think, fair. I mean, don't you ever have these, you know... So once somebody said, you know, you're contradicting yourself. Yeah, yeah, of course, I'm full of contradictions. I mean, Jesus' parables are basically paradoxes. The last shall be first, but what do you mean last shall be? I mean, last will be last. I mean, this is, you know, that the widow gives. Well, I mean, I would even say, if not every, uh, every parable, then definitely the majority of Jesus' paradoxes are, 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 are um, I'm sorry, Jesus' parables are, are paradoxes. Something that doesn't, you know, doesn't make sense in, in, in. and that's, okay, so, well, uh, no, that's a different topic. So, okay, um, so it has the, uh, uh, if I agree with, okay, yeah, so, yes, what you said, your second part of the question is something that I, that I, that I do describe in, in some depth in the book, and that's the idea, it was a, what I call the first explanation of a business cycle, that it's morally induced, so in other words, history follows, um, in time lag ethical behavior. In other words, that's exactly what you said, when the nation is just and treats nicely its orphans and widows and, and follows the Lord's decree, then economic prosperity and peace will, uh, will follow, while when they do not, the um, economic and political decline will follow. Um, so that is the first explanation of, of business business cycle. It's coming back a little bit these days uh, with, all, with all these sort of um, um, uh, focus on, 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 on ethics and, and decrease of corruption and soft skills and, and, that, you know, it's, and, and, and all that. Um, now, if you, if, you, if you actually go into the Old Testament, there are two sort of streams of thought that are against each other. One is uh, you give me tenths of your offering, and the Lord will give you ten times back. This was exactly how the book of Job started. In other words, uh, in other words, devil says, well, you know, Job isn't really a righteous man. He's just a very good investor. He's an economist. He's a rational man. He would have to be stupid. I mean, he sacrifices one bull, and you give him ten. Uh, he would be stupid to, to see he's doing that. Um, so that's... So, so sorry. So, so there is this one, one thread in the Bible which says ethics pays uh, on this earth. Because the problem, of course, with Hebrews was that they, the idea of heaven wasn't developed definitely not, not, not tenth as much as in the New Testament. You've noticed that there is not much debate about heaven or hell in the Old Testament. few times slightly the bosom of Abraham, but that's basically all you get. So, in other words, for an Old Testament Hebrew, um, the reward that God or had, he had to do that, um, the due date was the death date. In other words, there was very little, the idea that reward comes after life was almost non, that's, that's a New Testament idea that comes from more, more, more from New Testament rather than from, from the Old so the problem for the Hebrews was much more complicated because the economics of good and evil, the sort of the payback, had to happen here on earth. 
So that's one, one stream of thought which says ethics pays. And then there is this disturbing element, which Job is a good example, that actually no. And, but you can also hear this sometimes with the psalmist. It rains on the good and the bad alike. You can hear it in Ecclesiastics, uh, even the most brutal sentence, how do I know that animal spirit rises, uh, goes down and the spirit of man goes up. Um, and this whole idea of this economics of good and evil, this was actually the whole, this was the cornerstone of, of my book was exactly this question, is there economics of good and evil? What Christianity did, if I may say so, is that it pushed the reward to afterlife. So the exercise was a little bit easier, yeah, because, you, because that's what we would say to Job today, you suffering here, you will be rewarded afterwards, which is very difficult to empirically then verify. I believe it, but it's unverifiable. This is the disturbing example that Jesus gives about the Lazarus and the poor man, because there you see a complete uh, swap of utility. So in other words, we don't hear anything bad that the rich man did. The only thing that we know about him is that he was rich. And we don't know anything about the poor man except that he was poor. We don't hear that he was righteous and that guy was evil. The only characteristic is rich, poor. And then in heaven they swap places and the argumentation is he already had his full of utility here on earth. That's why he must suffer on hell. So in other words, his penalty was he enjoyed himself too much here, while the poor man did not. That's why, he, that's why, not because he was moral, market. This, I think, is quite interesting about the parable. Not because he was moral. He deserved it because he didn't have it. Not for his moral um, qualities, nor for the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And by the way, the book of Job should be more disturbing to us Christians than we think, because if it's true that Job was right, then Paul isn't right when Paul says that nobody's righteous. And that if we could be righteous, then the, then the sacrifice of Jesus Christ would be non unnecessary. It's not, it's, you know, we often laugh at the friends of Job, but their position isn't all that easy. Because if you really admit that Job was righteous, then you arrive to this problem that Paul then says that nobody can be righteous if we could. So, um, um, so that's how I would argue, answer that difficult question that this isn't, really, this isn't really clear. In the New Testament, then, Jesus completely dismantles the economics of good and evil. He stops counting. You can even see this little bit, blessed is the man whose sins God does not count. And Jesus, that's why Jesus doesn't talk about... Well, my most radical theory about Jesus is that he, the, the bone that he had with Pharisees was that Pharisees basically be saying what today's economists or scientists are saying, that the world behaves according to rules, and these rules need to be discovered and, adher and, and followed. So Pharisees had it like this a little bit, but morally. The, wor the moral world is based on rules. These rules need to be described by us, of course. You know, that's a small little detail there. Um, and then you must follow them in order to reach the real God, whatever. And Jesus says, no way. The world is not structured according to, to rules. And it, this is, again, I repeat, this is my radical reading. That's why I think Jesus so much talks about love and mercy, because love and mercy is fundamentally un... Um, you can't put it into laws. And Jesus says, well, it looks like the world, the basic strings of reality are formed by the archetypes of some structures, but no, underneath them, even more fundamental is love and grace and mercy. You can find that a little bit when you, when you bring up your children. How many times do you actually, of course, we have rules when, we, when it comes to children, but that's not what the children are about. That's not what love is about, and that's what not friendship's about. You always, always say to your kids, you know, you will not get any gifts if you, if you I don't know, don't brush your teeth. No, no gifts for Christmas. That's a law. If you don't brush your teeth equals no gifts for Christmas. We use this all the time. But how many times did you actually materialize that threat? Your poor son or daughter, it's a Christmas day or Christmas evening. 
oh, there's, there's no gifts. I said, yeah, don't you remember 15th of May? You didn't brush your teeth. Yeah. <laughs> so there is a sort of a paradox, which you can even see a little bit in the dynamics between the Old and New Testament. There are laws, but then again, God wants them to be forgotten by himself. So in this way, again, my radical reading of Christ's death, God died to himself so that he wouldn't actually have to keep, I don't, know, I don't want to say have to keep the laws, so that he could uh, yeah, accomplish it, but really at the end of the day, not follow his behavior to us human beings according to these laws. So that he could be free to, to, to take in heaven whoever he likes, regardless of, of, of the laws that, uh, that, that he had. Perfect. Thank you very much for your attention and please enjoy your time in Prague. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Sedlicek, and we did promise to get you out on time. Um, I hope you do get out well enough. My prophet university always used to say, um, if, you make them, if you make the people think they're thinking, they'll love you. But if you make them think, they'll hate you. Oh, okay. <laughs> so watch it when you get out of here. <laughs> okay, <laughs> because okay. I think you've accomplished the second one. Okay, thank you. That's the greatest compliment that I could have. <laughs> heard. Thank you. Matt's Tunahek on my left. Matt's is the worldwide coordinator of the uh, Business as Mission movement um, under the auspices of the Lausanne Committee for World Evangelization uh, from uh, uh, Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, Dr. Arlene West Westerhoff is from Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Arlene uh, pastors a church there with her husband, Dick, who is also here. And uh, Arlene is very, very uh, involved with, invo uh, with uh, preparing the first Christian uh, economic summit here in, um, in Holland, which will take place in September. Maybe you can say a little bit about that later. And then we have um, uh, Dr. Bruno Roche, who is the uh, chief economist of Mars um, Incorporated. Um, Bruno lives in, in Brussels. So um, I've asked um, uh, our three guests this evening to just describe very, very quickly uh, what is one highlight that you picked up from the presentation of uh, Thomas uh, Sedlicek? Who would like to start? Ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies first. Okay. Actually, one of the things that... Uh, struck me once again as uh, Thomas was speaking was about the fact that uh, we in the Christian community have unknowingly sometimes adopted more hedonism in our arguments than we realize. And as I was listening to that, uh, I just remembered that famous quote from Albert Einstein that we are not going to solve the current problems that we're in by adopting the same manner of thinking that got us into them in the first place. Now, I take a more positive view of things in the sense I do feel there's a God in heaven who is in charge of things. But I do realize also, too, that as uh, Thomas was speaking, what really spoke to me was this is indirectly a call to engage it really is a call for us as people who have been transformed on the inside to engage. Because if he said anything at all tonight, one of the things that he did say is that as unredeemed individuals, we are often unable to control our desires. And when there is a discrepancy or a mismatch between supply on the one hand and demand on the other, you've got two options, economically speaking. One is to control our desires, which will result in a lower demand, or sorry, yeah, lower demand. And the other, which the hedonists uh, advocate, is just keep increasing supply, keep increasing, keep increasing uncontrolled growth. And as a result of not being able to do that sufficiently, the future um, looks bleak unless we as Christians engage. And so what I heard uh, in Thomas's message tonight was an unequivocal and very clear call for us as Christians not to wash our hands 
of the economic situation, but rather to engage as transformed individuals seeking to bring transformation into this area so that God's love can be reflected through it. Thank you. Well, that was what spoke to me. Well, the first question is, did Dr. Sadacek brush his teeth on May 15 since he received a birthday gift? That's a, number one. Number two, of course, is similar to what uh, Arlene said. Our worldview informs us on how we're going to engage with society, with people, with challenges, with, with problems. And we constantly need to check and realign again and again. Is our worldview congruent with a biblical worldview? Because it makes a huge difference as how we will react to unemployment, to human trafficking, to a number of things. You know, if the, if the worldview is the pessimistic one, you know, the thing is going to hell. It was back in the good old days. You know, this the titanic thing, this is, this is sinking, we're just going to try to get souls to heaven. That, that, will, that worldview will inform on how we're going to engage with people and, and, and their context. Uh, I think we're often <clears throat> affected by kind of an evolutionary thinking whereby progress means it's getting better and better and better. And we want to think, oh, I'm an optimist, it's going to be better tomorrow. And that's not really a, a biblical worldview either. Uh, but if we mean by progress that I can serve someone, I can help someone. Someone was hungry yesterday, but not today. Someone was unemployed yesterday, but not today. Someone had not heard about Jesus yesterday, but had heard today. Somebody, the, the average lifespan was only 42 years, 10 years ago, and now it is 50 in, in that country, or there are less mothers dying you know, through childbirth 10 years ago, and so forth. That are people being served. That is progress. That is love demonstrated. So we're not supposed to be pessimists, that's not the biblical worldview. Then we can't engage as Christ wants us to engage. We're not to be optimists and put the things on our own court. If we are just doing more things, it will be better and better tomorrow. No, we are supposed to be hopeists. There's hope. Believing in, we're going to be signs of hope of the kingdom of God today where we can serve God and the common good by serving people in the micro level and, and, and the macro level. That's some of the things I take away from, from the book. I also had a holiday reading last year, and people said, you can't read Thomas Selashek for holiday reading. That's not holiday reading. I thought it was. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Bruno uh, Roche. Well, good, good evening, everyone. How was, um, uh, Thomas talked about three important themes, uh, progress, Shabbat, and good and evil. And these three themes all together, uh, in a sense, uh, shape the way we could look at economics. Um, and I would like to start with maybe the, the last uh, point, good and evil. What we call the Ten Commandments um, is, in a sense, in our society, the way we would describe uh, good and evil. And, but the Ten Commandments are not really commandments. And if you are uh, in, in Hebrew, the, uh, there are two tens. There is the accomplished tense and the inaccomplished tense. And most of the time, the accomplished is in the past and the inaccomplished is the future. But sometimes you have things which are inaccomplished in the future, in, in the past, and things which are accomplished in the future. Probably why actually uh, uh, psychoanalysis is a Jewish science. But if you, if you are careful, like, the commandments are not written in... A, in, in a legalistic way. Uh, they don't say, you must not kill. They knew you shall not kill. So in a sense, the, uh, the, the way the Bible talks about the Ten Commandments, or the uh, good and evil, is a promise. Each one of us is called to accomplish. 
And there are blessings associated with, uh, with the accomplishment of these things. So in a sense, good and evil is a really devious concept to me because we see through a Greek um, perspective. And the Greek are the inventors of polytheism. But the Jewish uh, said that God is one. They so don't say, you don't find in the Bible that there is only one God. God is one. And in a sense, uh, uh, our, uh, I think our, as an economist or as a business, pe business people, we are called to bring unity, to bring oneness in, uh, in what we do, to reconcile everything in one, and to accomplish the, uh, uh, the Ten Commandments, in a sense, and um, I would like to finish with one, um, one sentence, which is, the Shabbat is extremely important. I was so pleased that the Shabbat is, um, is a fourth commandment hmm, before adultery, hmm, <laughs> before robbery, uh, because the Shabbat is the um, artifact of freedom. The Jewish people was in slavery for uh, 430 years. And so the concept of rest was completely foreign to the, to the culture of slavery. And the first thing that God asked his people, as an artifact that they are free, you will rest. And one of the things I have been working on for the last 20 years is that, uh, uh, and as an economist, it should uh, uh, resonate with, with you as business people, is that the way God remunerates um, activity it's through rest. There is a Shabbat for the people every seven days. There is a Shabbat to the land every seven years. And there is a Shabbat to the capital every 50 years, every 49 years. And in Hebrew, the word Shabbat uh, and Shalom, actually, and Shekel, and Shekel is a, uh, is a, is a uh, currency you have in Israel. Like in, in Europe, we have the Euro. In England, we have the Sterling. In Israel, the shekel, the shekel and the Shabbat, the shalom, have the same meaning, the same roots. So in French, for those of you who speak French, it's, it works well. I mean, the, uh, uh, la paix et la paix. <laughs> so shalom and, and peace. Are the, so you remunerate someone when you give a rest to someone. You remunerate something when you uh, uh, give a rest to something. So this concept of Shabbat is so important. That's the way God wants to remunerate us. And because if we don't respect the Shabbat, and uh, actually, I don't know if you try not to respect the Shabbat. It's extremely difficult. I try every so often to not to do anything for one day, either a Saturday or a Sunday. It is extremely difficult. And in a sense, if we don't respect the Shabbat, we don't let God do his job. So our uh, work is fruitless. So there is something very, very important here that every time we respect the Shabbat uh, for our job, for our uh, work, or for the uh, planet, or for our um, capital or um, the uh, materialistic wealth, we don't let God be fruitful in our activities. So Shabbat is very, very important. The science uh, replacing religion as, a, as an ideology and, and economi ec econ yeah, economics is a, a science these days. Uh, and many people are arguing that we should go away from economics kind of as a mathematical exercise and, and bring it back into the area of, of moral reasoning. But um, the, he, also, he also mentioned the, um, my notes here, yeah, that economy, economics uh, econ uh, tells us how to behave. It's become kind of normative. Um, how, how, what, how, what would your reaction be to that? And what should our, our reaction be as Christians? Well, actually, we, we, we had a discussion uh, uh, with Thomas about this. And uh, um, uh, there, there is something is interesting in the Slavic language, like model and idol have the same um, um, meaning. And so every time we try to model something, which is a, a form of, a, of a representation of, of reality, of truth, we are maintaining the truth captive. And uh, a captive truth is not uh, alive. And when Jesus, uh, Jesus never said, uh, what I say is the truth. He said, I am the truth and the life and the way. 
And actually, again, in a, I don't have time here, but in Hebrew, the word uh, uh, truth means the opposite of what doesn't change. So again, you have the Greek thinking here and the Jewish thinking. In the Greek thinking, the truth is written in stone. Right? It doesn't change, and you relate to truth in a very cold way. In Hebrew, nobody can say, I have a truth. You, the only thing you can say, well, I know someone who pretends to be the truth. And I could have a living relationship with it. So it's a long answer to, to your question, but uh, an economic model is, again, uh, a Greek thinking applied to truth. Because economics is all about relationship. Relationship with what? Between what? Between people, community, and matter. And the matter is uh, limited. The uh, human uh, relationship or human knowledge is unlimited. We are everlasting in our nature. And in a sense, that's why uh, in, uh, as Christians or as Judeo-Christians, we are called to be like Jesus, the word made flesh. Okay? The flesh is limited, right? But the, uh, the, the word is unlimited. There is, there is no limit. And we have to deal with this continuous tension between the limitness of the matter, which economics is all about, and the unlimitedness of human nature, which is created in the image of God. And therefore, the economic model is, um, uh, is, a, death, is a dead form of understanding the truth. Uh, and uh, I know these days there is more and more uh, research about the relational economy, uh, about the, uh, 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 the uh, economics of, 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 uh, of reciprocity, etc. So, and there is now, we are, I think we are moving at a time when in economics it's called the, uh, the knowledge economy. So we, uh, 100 years ago, uh, we, we were in, uh, uh, in the land economy. So in order to be rich, you had to possess a piece of land. And the land is typically a rival good. If, if I own a piece of land, Arlene can't, 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 can't uh, own it. Then we move to the industrial economy. So the rich people were people who had shares, company shares. And again, we were in a kind of a rival economy. And we move to the service economy. And the service economy is all about banks. So in a sense, services, you see, you, software, for instance, is a good that if someone else shares that good, it doesn't uh, deduct the value to me. It's kind of neutral. But we are getting into something called a knowledge economy. Mm -hmm. And knowledge economy is an anti-rival good. And to some extent, this is a very interesting time because at the end of, in the end of the book of Daniel, there is a passage which says that at the end of times, people will run here and there and knowledge shall be increased. And he goes back again to uh, the concept of what is knowledge. And knowledge, the Bible, is a knowledge of good and evil. And, uh, but nevertheless, God, uh, um, God never had a problem with knowledge. Uh, and if you go back exactly to, uh, I, I wish we had more time to explain this, but the, when, uh, when the woman uh, eats the, the uh, fruit of knowledge, she listens to a lie of Satan, of the serpent, who says, if you eat the tree of knowledge, you will be like God. But in the previous chapter, God said, you are created in my image, in my resemblance. So God, it, Satan is trying to sell something that the, the people had before. But there is a small nuance here, is that in order to access to knowledge, according to God, it has to be a relational knowledge. It's when the, it, the man alone is not created like God, the woman alone is not created like God. It is when the man and the woman are, cre are together that they are created like God. And the adversary wants us to be God alone, the woman to be God like God alone, or the man to be like God alone. So in a sense, the concept of knowledge, according to, this is my view as a kind of a, maybe an economist, the, the, uh, the vision of knowledge, uh, which is uh, unlimited, can be holy, and could lead to an economic model only if it is in the context of a relational um, well, economy. Yeah, yeah. Can I ask a, a direct question about your, your business, uh, to bring it down to a more practical level? Yeah. Do you have a, you're a senior executive with Mars, and I think you're trying to make me eat a lot more Mars bars, mm -hmm. which I love, mm -hmm. but they're not necessarily good for me. Mm -hmm. But do you ever talk in your business about uh, 
enough or progress has to stop or we're making too much or well, do you ever, ever have any a, discussions along those yeah, lines yeah. of uh, well, we yeah, have, what does progress mean and uh, enough well, is enough? The question we asked in our business is that uh, what should be the right level of profit? And um, this is a question which was uh, well raised about 10 years ago, which is a very unusual question uh, for, for a company of the size of Mars to ask what is the right level of profit. And the idea is that um, uh, business is not about maximizing the value of a few, like your shareholders, at the expense of all the others. Mm -hmm. But business is about uh, bringing prosperity to everyone. And how do you measure prosperity? And so therefore, is it how much is enough? It is, it is uh, uh, the way I would answer this question that how much is enough for everyone? Mm. And then, then, when I have a better understanding of how much is enough for everyone, I can ask myself how, how much is enough for me? Mm. And it goes back again to the relational uh, dimension of God. There is more joy to give than to receive. And if you want, to, if you want to, to receive, give first, okay? And it's only when you have, when you are in these dimensions of, uh, of generosity or, uh, or understanding who you are as a relational being, it's only then that you are creating the image of God. And then you become creative. Because alone you can't be creative, right? And it's only when you, but in order to, for, for you to, to, to be creative, you have to understand your relational dimension. And to understand your relational dimension, you need to understand the need of the others. And actually, we, we, we do it all the time. As a father, I do it all the time. I, uh, recently, we, we discovered in a, uh, uh, putting people in fMRI that uh, the, uh, when uh, it was, it was uh, an experiment made by a friend of mine, a Buddhist monk, actually. And, and sometimes you have to work with these kind of people. But the, uh, the, uh, the, they made an experiment to put Buddhist monks in fMRI machines, okay? And Buddhist monks have this capacity to, to, f to focus their attentions on, on, on certain dimensions. And the Buddhist monks were asked to think about generosity, to meditate about generosity. And, and they were in the fMRI machine, and when they started to meditate about generosity, the, um, the areas of the brain which were activated were the one of happiness. So we are, uh, we are uh, built in our DNA to be generous, to give to others. So how much, and this, again, this is a lie of the enemy to believe, even the question, how much is enough? My grace is enough. Amen.